I'd like to welcome everyone to the first edition of our second season of the Belfry Hockey Podcast. Uh, this season, I'm going to focus on Belfry Offense, which is the book that's uh, about to come out, actually, very soon, and uh, I'm really excited about its release. And Basically, what Belfry Offense is, is it's a collection of a lot of the ideas I've had on offense and the things that I've learned over the last few years that I've compiled into one place and not just like randomly put it all together but actually like stitched it together so that it's an actual model and I think sometimes I know I'm guilty of this myself is like I would collect so much information there's so much information out there you have so many influences you have so many people that you talk to you have a lot of video that you reviewed and over the course of all that there's a lot of things that jump out at you as positive things that you want to keep and then there's a lot of things that you know have a place and time and then eventually it evolves or adds layers start to add and you know you, it ends up being very fragmented and I found like offense in general is extremely fragmented in its in its utility and and, and it's in its understanding frankly I think a lot of people and myself included have have spent a lot of time taking a look at offense and studying offense but there's a lot of gaps in understanding and a lot of things that need to that need further explanation and and to get to a better place to where both you can understand it and then ultimately communicate it better to your players so what Belfry Offense is for me is it's a central place that we take a look at a, a methodology or, a, or a, a game model for lack of a better term that stitches its way throughout the entire game and offers ideas, some of the best ideas that I think um, are current on how to generate offense and it's a place to start and my hope is is that when people read the book they're more inclined to take a look at their own fragmented uh, understanding of of offensive pieces and develop their own game model and something that that works for them to better understand it because then the better under you understand it the more easily it's going to be for you to communicate it and a lot of offense is is difficult to communicate because it's it's something that you have to really understand in order to communicate and that's it's like anything um you know those who really want to keep everything like well keep it simple or dumb it down what you're trying to do is you're fragmenting your taking your fragments of of understanding and you know you have all these gaps and so you just go you know what like instead of understanding it further I'm just gonna reduce it down to its lowest level and uh, that doesn't help anybody it doesn't help any players and it certainly doesn't help you so it's just something to take time to really truly understand and offense has a real complexity to it that I have come to really love and I've spent a lot of time with some of the best offensive players of our generation and I'm learning every day something new it feels like and in watching them and watching how they express offense and the different challenges that are presented in offensive hockey so for me uh, that's why I wrote the book and I just felt like there's nothing out there like that that really connects it um, in the way that I hope this does for people and then like I said it, it gives you a jumping off point to kind of add some of the things that are missing and some of the things that are, are more true to you um, but it's a book and that's why I want to do the, the podcast because in any book I've written a few now uh, there's a lot that gets put on the cutting room floor just because you don't have enough space for it or if you tried to write it exactly to the letter of everything that you understand it's going to be thousands and thousands of pages and no one wants to read that so to get it into a bite-sized form you have to leave a lot out and that's why I want to do the podcast because now I can take 
aspects of the book and expand it out into um, some of the other things that I would have I would have had to cut out of the book and so just kind of further further continue along this discussion and maybe add some more discussion points to the process so uh, without further ado I'm going to start with episode one of the of uh, Belfry offense and and basically uh, the premise of the book is is this interconnected game model and so it, it basically refers to it's it's a lens it's it's a way to look at the game and, and the relationship between the relationship between team tactics so f for example uh, one of the things I've learned over the years is like if if a team or a player is struggling in like on a breakout for example and they they just struggle with uh, coming out clean or making making good decisions or handling pressure or whatever the case may be rather than focusing on breakout skills as the first place that you would focus on you'd focus on the thing before that which would be like retrieval or defensive zone coverage so how did you get to the breakout what was the thing that happened before that? Because the thing that happened before that is likely going to give insight into why you're struggling with the actual breakout. So for me, it's always the thing that is occurring immediately before and then ultimately what's happening afterwards. So for example, another example would be on if your team is struggling on entries or a player, individual player you're working with is struggling on entries. Well, for me, I don't look at the entry. I look at how they got to the entry. So it's the exit and how they position themselves coming out of the defensive zone or you know, how they put themselves in the, in the position to ultimately get into the entry situation because that's often illuminating. And in that illumination, you're able to really pinpoint where the issue, where the issue is. And then as you work your way from that step before into the actual step of where you're going, what ends up happening is you get a much more complete picture on what you need to have in terms of the information to be able to make good decisions on how to build the development plan in order for the player to player or players or team to improve. So that's the interconnected game model is, is that it's it's everything is together. That's why I didn't create chapters in the book. That's so one thing you'll see is that there's no chapters because Everything's connected, so I didn't want to have. I don't want to say, oh, it's an interconnected game model, but then we have chapter one and chapter two, and they feel like they're separated. Everything is together, and one thing kind of leads to the next. It's kind of one, it, it rolls into the next, and that's how I wanted it to feel when you're reading the book. So that's a bit of a unique thing, I suppose, um, as it relates to when you're re reading it. You're looking for a chapter, you know, where the chapters are. There aren't chapters. There's 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 game phases that we're that we're trying to that we're trying to look look through. I've I've identified seven of them. Um, one of them is uh, offensive zone possession. So that's the first one. I start Belfry offense in the offensive zone, not surprisingly, and uh, and then kind of work backward from there. So it's offensive zone, uh, op possession offense. Then you have uh, possession line changes. Then you have offensive zone exit kill. Then you have neutral zone transition re-entry. Then you have rush entry denial. Then you have retrievals. And then you have uh, zone coverage exit to rush entry. So those are the seven kind of aspects of Belfry offense. And like I said, one rolls into the other. And when you look at that, um, each, each one of those things has a piece that uh, that has a before and after. So if we look just randomly, I'm looking at neutral zone transition reentry. So the, the the thing that happens before neutral zone transition reentry is offensive zone exit kill. And then the thing before that would be offensive zone possession. So you had possession, you lost possession, they're trying to exit, you exit kill it, now it gets in the neutral zone, now you try now you get possession, now you're looking to reenter. And then from the re-entry, now, now you have the entry, now you're gonna get into the rush entry, and then ultimately you're gonna get into the off offensive zone. So it's, it's all of, all of it, that's what I mean about the connectedness of it, and that's how I, try to, that's how I tried to build it uh, in, 
in the uh, in the book. So the next thing that I wanted to do was just kind of dig into I'm, what I'm, my plan is with this um, with this with this uh, podcast is to kind of grab one element of it. There's hundreds of elements of this of the book, and I want to just take one of the pieces and just kind of work work from there. So one of the pieces that I wanted to start off with is in the in the offensive zone. One of the things, one of the questions that I ask is like, what are the key factors that restrict teams from attacking interior? Why do teams struggle attacking interior? And I think that one of the reasons why that is the case that's under talked about. So you have you have possess, you know you have perimeter players that we talk about. Oh, the players perimeter, you know they only stay to the outside, and then your team. You have perimeter teams that don't attack to the inside and you say, okay, so for me, my question always is why are teams, why do teams struggle and why do players struggle for attacking interior? Like what are the factors? So I come up with a few different factors, but not the least of which is, um, is attacking interior and, and trying to figure out why those things, why, why those things are. And what, one of the reasons why I think that teams and players struggle is because if you're not proficient in offensive zone defense, then that weakness is going to bleed into your offensive zone play. And, and so if your team struggles with exit kill and you're not confident in being able to be able to how in being able to get the puck back once you're in the offensive zone, well, you're going to be less, you're going to be less interested in putting the puck in competitive situations. For example, you're, you're, going to, you're not going to shoot it as much because if you shoot it, the, the second the puck leaves your stick, it's now open uh, as a 50-50 at best to get the puck back. And if you're not confident that you're going to get the puck back, you, know, you don't want to leave the offensive zone. So you're probably not going to shoot as much or you're going to be very choosy with the shots that you take. Um, and so that's a big aspect of why teams struggle, why teams and why players struggle is because struggle in the offensive zone and attacking interior because when you move the puck into the inside of the ice, there's risk. There's going to be risk that you're going to either turn the puck over, the puck's going to get blocked, there's going to be a tick, a deflection, um, you know, the pass might not be on. You know, there's a risk that there's a risk and a probability that improves that you're going to lose control of the puck in the middle of the ice and that the other team is going to be able to counter you. So the more that you're concerned about turning pucks over, you're going to be a not, and, and the reason that you're concerned about turning pucks over is because you don't feel comfortable with your ability to defend. The more that that's the case, the more probable that you're going to be unwilling to utilize the mid, the interior of the ice. So if I, if you're a coach and you say, well, listen, we need to attack interior. And then the next breath you say, okay, but don't turn pucks over. Like we're, that's where you're, you, that's, that's where you're going to struggle. If you have a, an aversion to turning pucks over, it's going to be difficult. And you, and you're in your preaching that all the time. Don't turn pucks over. Don't take care of the puck, manage the puck. Well, manage the puck by definition in hockey is to put pucks in safe areas where we can either easily defend it or that we can keep the puck. So that's management of the puck. It, that's usually how it's usually how it's expressed. So when we say, well, now we want to attack interior, you're not exactly like managing the puck because you're bringing pucks into dangerous areas where it's probable that there's going to be a high prob higher probability that you're going to lose, lose possession of the puck. So one of the first uh, hurdles in having a team learn and a player learn to attack interior much more is to get them more proficient in defending in the offensive zone. So, you know, your, your F3, which I talk a lot about in this book because I think F3, and I think F3 and the weak side defenseman are two keys to that, that generate a lot of offense and, and are responsible for a lot of offense and keeping pucks alive in the in offensive situations. And and so those two pieces I'm I talk about all the time. And 
and this is no different. If you want to be able to attack interior, then you have to be you have to be okay with turning pucks over in the in the middle of the ice in the offensive zone. And in order to be okay with turning pucks over in the offensive zone in the middle of the ice, well, you have to be you have to know that that you're not putting your team at tremendous risk. Like you can't be you can't have a player come down you know the outside. What, like a, a D, for example, gets the puck at the top. They, uh, you know, step by the strong side forward. They attack down the wall, and then they throw a puck into the middle of the ice. The other team intercepts the puck, and bang, uh, you know, now it's a it's a two on one against. You're you're not going to be as encouraged to want to do that. Both the kid that was was trying to attack interior. The team in general is probably not going to be looking to make those types of plays, and then you as a coach, you're going to be, uh, you know, you're going to be on high alert to to not have those plays happen. But yet the puck has to go to the interior because that's the most dangerous place for it to for it for it to happen for to score. So now you become perimeter, and your players have a hard time getting inside. And that's not to say that the puck is the only thing that gets interior. The puck is not the only thing that gets interior. Players also need to be be comfortable going interior. But again, going interior, there's risk. There's risk of contact. There's risk of you know getting all getting um, getting boxed out to be able to get the puck back. There's uh, there's risk of all of different factors that make it more like there's risk I'm not going to get the puck so I move into the middle to get the puck but there's risk I'm not going to get the puck so then why would I go into the interior if it's not going to be there I might be better off to put myself in a possession place so rather than go rather than be in the in the in the slot maybe it's better for me to move to the half wall because now I can get an easy puck puck to the half wall and we can maintain possession I get a puck touch but you know it, it's not threatening so again, it's, it's the puck and it's people trying to find ways to attack interior and it comes from a willingness and an ability to be able to defend from the, from the inside. So again, those two keys, like there's, to me there's three, three key pieces. I, I mentioned two of them. One is the F3, a, a reloading F3 that gets above that is, you know, we that's pretty standard. We hear that all the time now, and it's kind of a staple on many teams. Uh, many, uh, almost every team that's good has a reloading F three that they can count on. So, so that's one part of it. The second part of it is a weak side defenseman who's active in exit kill. This player can attach to speed either the 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 slashing uh, forward that the weak side D will pick that player up and be right there and be able to contest a puck that gets out there, either chipped out or passed out to that player, uh, that they're not going to see that puck. This player is going to be able, this weak side defenseman is going to be able to shut that whole program down. Um, they can also attach themselves to center speed, um, and they can also uh, work themselves over to any passes or pucks that might be in the middle of the ice. So if you could envision, like again, a puck carrier going down the side, they move the puck to the interior. It kind of gets uh, bounced around. Finally, the weak side forward, their weak side forward gets it, starts to come up the ice. Well, now the weak side defenseman comes in uh, on a good angle, kills the play, and now you keep the puck alive. You maintain possession, or at minimum, you eliminate their ability to counter intelligently. That They're not getting two-on-ones on that. And so that's really what, what we're talking about, is trying to really – find ways to defend when in the offensive zone to to reduce our fear of turning pucks over in the middle of the ice in the offensive zone to then want want encourage our players to want to be able to attack attack interior so that's that's the that's the first the, the first two the third one is your f2 track which is usually someone around the net so um, when the puck is on the on the outside with one player, we don't want to have four people on the outside. We have one puck carrier on the outside. You have an F3 who's reloaded but is high and in the middle of the ice. You have your weak side defender who is also in the middle of the ice. And then you have your F2 who's usually somewhere around the net. So that's three people now in the middle of the ice with one uh, with one puck carrier and perhaps the strong side defenseman who are also now on the pucks uh, outside the dots. 
and and then and then from there depending on whether the puck is shot or it's passed or whether it's sent to the bottom your net front guy or a guy who's around the net landing on the net he's going to then be able to have to support the play but the f2 track to be able to come from behind the puck so the puck turns over like i said it's that same play pass gets puck pass gets um, gets made to the inside it's scrambles around in the slot it comes to the weak side forward that f2 should be sprinting with back pressure on top of that puck to try to keep the play alive and the harder that they sprint the more they can win pucks back and we can keep the puck alive and again reduce the amount of stress that comes from turning a puck over in the middle of the ice so that's one of the that that whole sequence i think is a really important a really important piece that helps teams and individual players understand why they struggle so much with attacking interior. And that's just one, that's just one idea. Uh, there's lots of ideas of why teams and individual players don't want to attack interior. Uh, but one of the biggest ones uh, in my mind is, is risk and how we, how we frame risk to our players. And so to me, risk is less about the turnover and more about the defensive response to the turnover. If you have, if you can ha come to a point where you can accept turnovers, because you understand that your team is in good position to be able to defend that turnover, your players will be more understanding of how to manage that risk. So I think it's a double-edged sword. I, I, I think we sometimes, as coaches, we we don't we we don't want there to be any risk so we tell them not to not to turn pucks over so now they don't use the middle of the ice um, or we tell them only do it when it's when there's a high high percentage of being able to make a puck make a play in there um, but if they're not doing it frequently then they're not able to read uh, what what has uh, a good probability of success and what doesn't then you have the time and the score there are also factors because sometimes you're just pressing and you need to you know you need to score you need to try to tie the game so now you're pressing and that takes you out of your rhythm and it takes you out of your out of your normal you know game plan and now you're more risky than you than you would like to be so but that happens like you're not going to lead every game you're going to be behind and you're going to need to score and you're need going to need players to find their way into interior plays so what are we doing to help them? And this is, these are some of the ideas. So the first, first thing that I think is really important is in the offensive zone, and it goes back to like the old adage that the best time, the best time to set up your defending is when you're on offense, and the best time to set up your offense is when you're defending. So those two things happen simultaneously. And the more you have an understanding of that, and then more the the more you see a duality and your players see a duality of the positions in the offensive zone or the spots. So I just described those three spots, the net front F2 track, the F3 reloading F3, and then you have your weak side defenseman. The more you the more your players view those as dual responsibilities or dual positions. They carry an offensive responsibility as well as a defensive responsibility. And you empower them to be able to make good decisions when they're on the opposite side. So when the team has full possession of puck, like where's your weak side defenseman? Is the weak side defenseman standing still growing roots in the middle of the blue line? Or are they active with their footwork and moving and surfing and putting themselves in positions that offensively they would be in a great spot if they got a puck, they'd be able to threaten. Or if they don't get the puck and the other team gets a puck, they have great proximity to be able to challenge that play, challenge that exit, and put yourself in a position where you can keep the puck, which would be, again, you, your team would have more of an interest in trying to attack the interior. The other thing, too, and I just touched on this a second ago and wanted to circle back with it, which is, I think sometimes the teams who attack the middle or interior the least are the most risky with it. And the teams, and they don't play the percentages as well as you would like to see. And I think that that's a frequency. They don't do it enough 
And so they don't have the same familiar familiarity. And when they do do it, it's a little bit more forced, which then stacks the deck against them. And then it becomes self-fulfilling. Well, we don't use the middle of the ice because we turn pucks over, but we turn, but we don't do it enough. And so that's what feeds into that. So the idea is we need to do it more. And if we do, if we do it more, we're going to put ourselves in a situation where we're going to be able to have make better decisions. And by making better decisions with the puck, we're going to want to do it more, et cetera, et cetera. Now you get into four switches and people are moving off, off the puck and they're reloading into better positions. They understand not only we're not just reloading, we are also relocating, which is you know, there sounds the same, but it's not. There's two, those are two different things, but one feeds into the other. Though I got an F3 who's reloading. Um, that's the defensive term. He's reloading to get above the puck so that if anything bad happens, he's above it. Then now he can compete for it and doesn't. We don't have to use our defensemen. Our defensemen aren't vulnerable to pinching at bad times when the play is not set up for that. If we have a reloading F3, we're in a great position. But we also need to have that player relocating. So that means we still have to control the puck. They're relocating in the offensive zone into soft ice, for example. And that's the duality of it. Um, so it's relocating and reloading. It sounds the same. Two very different things, but one feeds into the other. If you're not reloading, it's going to be difficult to be relocating. And so that's where we run into the duality of those two positions, the, the, those two spots. And so uh, this was a good one to, to kind of start off with. I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, it's just a great way, like this, what, this section that I'm talking about in the book that we just talked for, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes. It's, uh, it's probably 12 or 14 lines in the, in the book. So there's so much that we are not able to dig into because, like I said, in a book, um, we're able to just touch on it and move on. So I want to support the book with this with this podcast, and uh, hopefully it'll give us, you know, a lot of different top. Like there are hundreds of topics in the book. I'll, I won't be able to. I won't run short of topics. That's for sure. But it gives us a chance to kind of dig into it a little bit deeper. So there you have it. That's episode one.